Okay, thank you very much, Sanju, and uh, everyone. I'm so glad that you're all here. And, you know, we have a wonderful CI delegation here. And to represent that delegation, we have a few people who will be joining me on stage. But what better time to, after COVID, and now when, when things are opening up completely, to have these delegation come up and forward, because then we can meet, finally. I mean, having all these Zoom meetings, having telephone meetings, emails, it is just not the same thing. Meeting, creating these meetings, meeting outside, networking. And we can always see, because it's always fun to be in the networking session as well, to talk to people, right? And having delegations coming now from India, it makes me so happy, because it, it really gives the more value to the work that we try to do, which is not only connecting people, but providing that you know, value to everyone. And what better time to have it than the India-Sweden uh, Innovation Day of 2023, where we have so many celebrations going on. Uh, it's not only 10 years of it, this day, but in Sweden, India at 75, Sweden in a business council. We turned 20 this year, and some of you were there, but it's a long time. And um, so I can unequivocally say that this is a milestone uh, between Sweden and India. So let me allow to uh, invite the, the guests up on stage. Sanjay Kapoor, chairman of Sonocom Comstar, and you were here earlier also, also the chairman of Confederation of Indian Industry, the European Committee. So please. And then Rajinder Singh Bhatia from Bharat Forge uh, Defense. And we have Samir Sina from Savvy Industries, please join. And Manisha Singh, yes, there also from Lex Orbit's partner and founder. And Tito Kishan, there you are, please join. Free seating, anywhere. Uh, from Pro, Pro In, that's how you pronounce the company? That's right. Okay, wonderful, come. I will sit here. So we have a, a panel call, will Make in India help drive innovation in India? We will get into that in a little bit, but before that, I think it's good that we all get a little bit of a feeling of which companies these are and the people. So I'm just gonna ask all of you to share a little bit about your company, about three, three, four minutes, and also touch upon what you're doing in innovation today. So we get a little bit of that flavor today also as well. So yeah, please. Thank you, Robin. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for this wonderful opportunity. We've traveled from India and it's been a wonderful um, realization uh, to hear people talk about India. Uh, sometimes living in India, we don't get the perspective of what people think about India. And it's very, very heartening to see the way people are looking at India today. So thank you for this opportunity. My name is Samir Sinha. I am um, a real estate developer uh, based out of Ahmedabad in the western part of India. Um, and we are committed to sustainable development. And uh, we also have a sustainable consulting company. And my interest here is to, uh, to collaborate with uh, the leaders of sustainable and sustainability in the world. And that is my interest for coming to, uh, to Sweden. So thank you for this. Thank you so much. Rajinder, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Robin, uh, for conducting this session, and uh, Indo-Sweden Business Council for giving us this opportunity to be here. Uh, you asked me to describe a bit about our company and what I am doing. I'm part of a mid-sized Indian company group called Kalyani Group. Bharat Forge is the flagship company of that group. We do have one entity in Sweden, which is uh, BF Shilsta. And of course, uh, we have some entities in other parts of Europe. Uh, what I do in that company uh, was a bit like a startup. I joined this company 13 years ago, and I was asked to set up a defense and aerospace business. Um, I can probably say that uh, we made uh, quite a successful uh, foray into that group. Uh, this year, we would be doing about $200 million. 70% of that would be exports out of India. And uh, I started as one person. I have about 700 people reporting to me. I have six companies which have been established since that in that group. And I'm chairman of all the six companies. That's the introduction about me. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got you have a mic, I think. Thank you, Tito, please. Okay, hi. Um, thanks to CI and uh, SIBC for having me here. Uh, my name is Kishan, Tito Kishan. I'm an inventor. Uh, I'm a TRIZ and organizational transformation coach. We teach how to invent. And we work with corporations on defining two things. 
how you can build innovation and IP strategy, and very specifically, how you develop inventions. Uh, Proin is, is the firm that I've started with, is founded. It's process innovation, product innovation, and what we do is we groom professional innovators. The intent of being part of this is, uh, you know, we have so many MNC, R&D firms back in India. And now, how you can actually increase the value chain of the teams back in India, they can actually give you tremendous value back to the businesses. That's something which I thought it would be right to put across. And being a startup, we work with large corporates and funded startups and actually contributing to significant inventions. Thank you. Thank you. Manisha. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very glad that I am asked to give introduction after Kishan spoke about invention because uh, I was since morning attending the session and there was a lot about the big corporations, um, investment, manufacturing and all. But the title says innovation and uh, I'm an IP lawyer, intellectual property lawyer, and I practice patents, trademarks, uh, its protection and enforcement. So what Tito said is that um, he trains for innovation, would love to connect with you on that. And um, I represent my law firm, uh, Exobis. It was started in 1997. And uh, it was a unique venture because at that point of time, scientists and engineers were not taking up a career as a patent attorney in India. Uh, we used to goad them to take it up as a career so that, and today we are very glad that it has happening. And um, it's a testimony to that initiative which led to changes in the Indian Patents Act which made mandatory a technical qualification in 2003 amendment. And here we work for many of the Swedish companies and they're very confident about the Indian ecosystem, IP ecosystem. So shall cover more in uh, further ahead. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manisha. Sanjay. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Um, and, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, so we're in, we are an automotive technology manufacturing company and I specifically use the word technologies because of all the disruption that's happening in automotive, we continuously invest in technology. Uh, you know, we're, we used to be a pure play uh, combustion engine business. We 30% of our revenue comes today from EVs, going up to 75% over the next five years. Uh, we've also invested now in autonomous driving because we believe that is the future. And we're continuously looking at automotive as a technology platform and not just a, a manufacturing platform. We're trying to create a hub in India for the world from a manufacturing perspective because we believe that in India we have the talent, we have the skill sets, we have the ability to create a large manufacturing operation in India with a, with a very well-defined uh, supply chain, specifically in the automotive industry. So we're, you know, primarily, today I wouldn't say we're in automotive, but we're in mobility because anything that moves is becomes part of, uh, you know, our customer base. So from uh, the traditional vehicles to drones to bots to anything that actually moves and we supply to so we're in the mobility industry. Thank you. And do you see that now moving forward, given that automotive industry in India is one of those industries you can produce from A to Z, you know, car and bus, everything. Um, do you see that the knowledge coming out of that as ripple effects in other industries? Could be drones, could be other things, but also in technology services particularly. Because we see like in Gothenburg, there's this huge uh, automotive industry and the software companies popping up there are amazing. Do you see the same thing happening in India? Yeah. So, you know, um, the competitive landscape is changing in our industry. Uh, you know, when we used to compete, when, when we went out to see companies that were innovative, you'd see Bosch or ZF. Today you're seeing plug and, plug and play, Microsoft. So your industry, lands, the competitive landscape is completely changing. To, but to your specific point on collaboration, there's a huge benefit from collaborating with the electronics industry. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're going to see a large content of import in India across industries, close to, I'd say, $250 billion worth of imports over the next five years if we don't localize. And localization is something that the government is driving. When you talk about make in India, I would say we need to look at design in India because it's very important for us to learn how to design, spend money on R&D. In fact, going back to our own business, you know, our spend is between 35 to 6% of revenue on R&D. 
the industry average today in our auto component industry is about 0.5 to 1 percent. So that needs to sort of increase. And with again, with the import of electronics, the only way we can find the way to localize and scale is if we align with the electronics industry. Uh, so that again is, so there are great collaboration opportunities that will come up, to your point in software as well, sensors, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and several technologies like that, data analytics, that would actually become a part of the automotive industry or a big part of the automotive industry. So you need to look at our industries in a very different, uh, from a very different perspective. Mm. And if we connect this with the entire startup Indian startup industry, which is, I think, 75,000 new startups in, in the last few years, which is an incredible number. 90,000. Okay, so now we're up to 90,000, just in last year or something. Um, Manish, I want to ask you there, uh, do you see, in if, let's take the automotive business as an example, do you see a, a an increase in the number of patents coming out of India now than for like, let's just say, 10 years ago? How do you see this development? In which sectors do you see a bigger development? Thanks, Robin. And um, so, you know, the I'll just go a bit back, uh, almost 20, 30 years back when we start, when the India signed the TRIPS agreement. Indian uh, patent system had uh, hardly 5,000 to 7,000 patents coming in. And that also had just started coming with the economic, uh, new economic policy of the government of India. But today, what we see is very different. We have we, the, new result, the new numbers will be announced uh, soon. And I think we have already crossed 85,000, and of which it is 50-50. So the Indian ecosystem is also moving into R&D and has substantially moved. The government of India, through its various institutions, like you have the STIFAC um, in the biotechnologies, NRDC, De Department of Biotechnology, and uh, the DRDOs or the CSIR, the Indian Oil Corporations, Auto Component Manufacturing Associations, have been given impetus to R&D. And uh, trust me, the multinationals also have increased the R&D activities in India. Like name any, um, uh, like IBM has the highest number of innovations disclosures coming from the Indian R&D centers. Samsung and um, I mean, so I can give a count of multiple numbers. Even your own Ericsson, sitting from the Chennai Out Center over there, they have a huge R&D. And another section which I want to say, which Sanjay said about um, automotive industry, we had a past support R&D growing up in Gurgaon, Manisar area, Tamil Nadu, that is southern part of India, where many of these Japanese corporations had their R&D centers, manufacturing plants. So ancillaries were growing around that. And um, it has come out very well. And uh, startups also, the government has given a lot of support to the, has provided a lot of incentives to the startups, to the women inventors, so that uh, innovation multiplies. Another thing what has enabled more innovation is that uh, when the multinationals came to India, did investments, they could, they had an advantage of tapping into the brains of the intelligent brains of the country, which we are very famous for. And... Uh, so they also became more innovative. They learned a lot. They moved on to do their own enterprises, and they came up with very uh, good innovations. So hence, we see many startups, um, com corporations, getting absorbed by or bought in by the multinationals. Also, the MNCs support many startups. Like we have Qualcomm in India, they have a startup initiative. They take, they shepherd it, and they multiply it, and then they sell it off also. So I think, uh, not on, in my own experience is like we have an office in Bangalore, and we work very closely with the various incubators and startups, and it is doing wonders. Mm. And that is uh, in tech sectors and in, uh, say, industrial startups and small companies. Oh, sorry, I missed that question. Mm. Automobile is there, definitely uh, so, uh, mobile telephony is there. And uh, many of the Indian corporations are also going to, uh, are in taking initiatives to take up the telecommunications like the 6G and related of course, and now that's happening with 5G, which is amazing. So yes, yes, yes. And, and it's very aggressively aspirational. <laughs> it is, for sure. Um, yeah, I was like, I was attending a session and with the ministry, and uh, I was like taken aback. I was <laughs> representing Swedish corporations. And I was saying, oh, God, we have to gear up faster. 
<laughs> yeah, there, there, there's an incredible pace right now. Yes, substantially. That... Even um, I mean, though I have been practicing since '97, I see. Oh God, so many things are happening, and I have to keep up keep up pace with that. Let me say, uh, from the defense sector, Rajinder, how do you see this? It, the same development in the start? Because now the resilient or the self-reliant India is coming into play in a very, very strong way. And um, you want to produce everything in-house, basically, within defense, uh, which means that there, the, but, but there's quite a long way to go, uh, both in the startups, both in the innovation space, having gone from one uh, licensed manufacturing to mm. your own, right? Yeah. So can you comment a little bit on that? How do you see the innovation going to play a role here? Robin, I'll uh, get back a little into history and then get back to your sure. answer. Uh, India had a defense that day, what was called the reserved sector, which meant only the government-owned enterprises were handling them. At the start of this century, it was moved on to the licensed category. But all this really didn't uh, move the needle. The needle started to move when we started to talk about Make in India. And uh, Make in India compulsion actually came from the demography of the country. India today has a very young population. We have about, uh, our average age of an Indian is about 33 years. It's going to become 29 in the next few years, which will unleash a workforce of about 400 million Indians. And uh, manufacturing is the only way you get a multiplier when you start doing work in that. In service industry, it is one is to one compared to the revenue. Manufacturing gives you a multiplier of about six. Now, the white spaces which were available to the government lied in the area of defense and aerospace. So when they started to say make in India, it was not meant to be an exercise to isolate yourself. It was to address a demographic requirement of the nation. Mm -hmm. The second part, when we talk about make in India, it's meant to be all inclusive and not excluding the word out of it. What I'll does that mean that. exactly? Yeah, I'll give you an example. When we say make in India and self-reliant, it is not just meaning that you start manufacturing everything yourself in the country and cut off from the global supply chains. Mm. Far from it. In fact, Sanjay did make a mention of it. What make in India means is that the intellectual property lies in the country. It is not nothing more than that. You will continue to depend upon global supply chains but you're not dependent for intellectual property for anybody else. Because the recent examples of what is happening in some of the conflict zones is that if you do not have the intellectual property and if you are dependent upon somebody else, when the chips are down, nobody is going to come and help you. Mm. So what was really wanted was to keep that IP within the country. Mm. The second part, about the ecosystem and what weather make in India will lead to innovation. Let me answer that in a little different way. I think there was a mention by Manisha regarding uh, Indian brains being used. I can give you some figures. There are 813 MNCs working in India, employing close to 600,000 Indian engineers for research and development. Average saving for those MNCs is about $82 billion in terms of the cost of frugal development in the country. The cost of development in India is about still about $37 per hour for a very good R&D specialist. Compare that to Europe, I think it should be 160 and US should be around the same. And here it is euros, I'm talking about dollars. So there's a great saving in doing this work, but this work was being done for somebody else. Where did that innovation spark came which converted this work for outsiders to your own country? And that's where the Make in India came. So the question, will it drive innovation, is slightly misplaced. It will drive innovation. I'll give you one more example and finish my argument. What really drives innovation when actually you can tell a person, a startup, that in a reasonable time frame, you'll be able to convert your ideas into money. If we can see 
that light at the end of the tunnel, he will go and start working out there. In India, they started a program called IDEX, Innovation for Defense Excellence. India spent $6 million only and 864 new startups came up in defense with $6 million. Today that expenditure is still only $60 million and we have 1,000 people with tremendous amount of innovation being done. So that is what is driving the innovation in mm. the country. And that probably answers that question that will make in India help to drive innovation. I think that's no longer a question. It will drive. It will. Innovation. It's yes, for sure. The, Samir, on um, uh, within sustainability and infrastructure is probably one of the most important areas for I think any infrastructure to have is sustainable. And uh, do you see that, that that there are a number of startups coming into play? Do you work with that in in that way as well with startups, or do you see? new technologies for you, it may not be the same thing uh, as self-reliant India, right? You can, you can get technologies from anywhere in a different kind of way. But how do you work? So, um, uh, interestingly, Robin, uh, real estate and infrastructure development is probably the biggest culprit for uh, the problem that exists. Yep. Uh, we contribute to 40% um, of the greenhouse gases. Mm. We create the largest debris and construction waste. Uh, than any other sector. And that's included the entire value chain. So. The entire value chain. Uh, we consume more water than any other sector, mm. almost 40%. And so the responsibility of sustainable development, I think, lies squarely first and foremost on real estate and, and infrastructure development in the country. But the rules and regulations are there. So that's exactly the point I was trying to make, okay. is the good thing is that probably the government of India is the most progressive developer in the world today because not only are they the largest developers, mm -hmm. but they're also very, very progressive in terms of their commitment. India, as you know, is one of the only G20 countries that has actually met its Paris commitment, and we are very, very aggressive on meeting uh, our carbon emission targets. Uh, so the, the regulation that are in place in every state in, uh, in India, practically, if you follow the, what is known as the government GDCR, which is the government guidelines for making a building, you end up making a gold certified green building. Mm -hmm. just by following the bylaws. And there is really no, there is no such thing as a non-green or a non-sustainable building being built in India today. Mm -hmm. um, most markets, most urban markets today, fly ash brick is cheaper than red bricks, which is to be make, made from the topsoil, uh, which is non-sustainable. This is the economy of scale that the country has already achieved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think now the next, uh, next era needs to look at how technology or how digital uh, twins can be created and how we can make this whole sector more efficient. And there's a lot of work that is being done in terms of the, the technology that is available, BIM solutions, AutoCAD, and the technologies that are there to create models where we can reduce efficiencies and make this whole more efficient. Mm -hmm. Also, the entire air conditioning, HVAC, um, and electrification, and water. These are areas which are huge in terms of sustainable development, uh, which needs to be addressed. And that is where countries like Sweden uh, need to collaborate with India and to bring those solutions, which they have already uh, built. And there is a market, there is a huge scale. Um, whatever may even be not be as viable here is easily viable in, in, in a market like India. So those are the opportunities that I see coming up. So I think water is one area which I think Sweden and India is working a lot on. And there was the World Water Week the other week when, when our colleague Arti was moderating the entire, entire week. And uh, there's clearly a huge interest in that area. And water is, of course, very scarce. Uh, but then also, I think, in, in, um, do you see that they're more like in, in basic cement? There's an, a huge companies in, in producing cement. What, what are, are they also driving innovation? They're cement and steel. Obviously, Steve, remain obviously, yeah. the largest uh, culprits also. Yeah. But let me tell you, going back to the point about water, not only water, water and air, mm. the challenge with India is that Indians perceive air and water to be free. Mm. Um, and that remains our biggest challenge. There is hardly any city in India which has metered watering. Mm. 
So don't we all, but okay. Right, and, <laughs> and, and it is till we start paying for these resources, we will not value it. And but it's very interesting, sorry, let me interrupt you. We, we had a, a huge CEO delegation in, in uh, um, March, and um, we, had, we were tasked by identifying a couple of startups in India to talk about uh, the, the green transition and what kind of solutions India would require, and AIR was one of them. And we found a number of them, which is hugely interesting, like Carboledger, which is very... You know very why that is, right? Because people live in Delhi and it's the most polluted country in the world. Of course. <laughs> it's getting better, <laughs> it's but yeah. It's necessity. It's coming out of pure necessity, yeah. which is a great thing. But even then, people still don't value it in other cities. Yeah. who don't go suffer this. And Delhi is, is already too late, I feel. Mm. We are, there's no solution immediately that you can apply. No, not immediately. Months I think are going so, to be yeah. bad. So, but we, we, when we come to innovation in, in India, it's, it's a very broad word, obviously. And uh, I want to ask you, Tito, because you, you work with companies and, you know, and large companies, small companies, right. and groom them into innovation. How do you do that? Is it, and do you think this is something India really needs? Um, because if you look at the, the numbers, generally, I think Indian industry has some of the lowest per, per uh, uh, investments in R&D in the world, right? 0.6%, which is very low. Is, is, low. is this something? Something that you're working on and, and methodologically sort of progressing in one Now, there are, of course, other companies, the larger ones, which have higher. And I'm sure Sanju and, and all you guys sitting here, I know you, and especially also uh, Defense is, is investing more. But how do you work on this? Now, I think, Robin, that's a very important point. Uh, one is about the investment. I think there's no substitute to that. I think corporations are understanding the hard way. And there's no free lunch. People need to invest. But I think where they invest is very critical. Mm. Uh, like Make in India is something which is a direction. Like what Sanjay talked about, design in India. But I think I would say it's invent in India. That's a trademark that I own. So when we talk about what uh, Rajendra talked about on IP being in India, it's very critical that you need to build the capability. Because if the capability is not there, this is the opportunity. And if the capability is not there, you can't do. And when you're talking about a workforce of about uh, millions of people, and that's the biggest strength what India brings to the entire world. If you, don't, if you can't build the capability of the people to invent, because traditionally, people have been, uh, I've been part of uh, MNC for 15 years. And when you look at the entire evolution, mm. people are pretty much taking work and trying to contribute to it. But now, as long as you work in that model, you're only being a part of the entire value chain and not seeing the big picture. But when you start empowering your people to think beyond what they have been asked to do, that's where the invention, structured innovation methods of TRIS, that's where I teach. TRIS stands for theory of solving inventive problems. An inventive problem is one which has two conflicts. For example, the earlier circular economy, the discussion which came out. So if you're talking about, uh, if you want to have traceability, right? It's very important to find traceability so that you can able to recycle it. But you can't build traceability because it invades privacy. It's a conflict. Mm. Now, unless and until you don't find conflicts of conflicting requirements, you can't come with inventive solutions. Mm. So how we build the capability is basically two things. One is we impart the methods of TRIS, and we impart the methods of design for patentability. For example, uh, many times people pad themselves with one patent file. But once it is published in 18 months, it's yeah. in public domain. Mm. Now your competition can actually can circumvent your patent in no time. A and actually, I work with them. Mm. But the positive side is you make sure that your invention is not circumvented by others. Mm. So that's where we bring the design for patentability, where we work with people, come with inventions, and then strengthen the invention such that no one can circumvent it. So that's also, I mean, because you, you, you talk then about <laughs> you have to do it in corporate culture. That's right. That's a culture that you need to incorporate in the Absolutely. company. And I'm going to ask Sanju, uh, Sanjay that is also later on how, how you work on the same thing. Uh, but it's also a country culture sometimes because, of course, in India it's not... Uh, the historic has been very hierarchical. So having people just go out there and invent is not really the... the has not been the local culture. Unless it's Jugard. Then everybody's an expert, obviously, right? But here, how do you, how do you see that in, in the corporate way? that are people, uh, is, it, is it easy or is it? Uh, it's really tough, mm -hmm. but what is changing? I think the exposure is changing. The necessity is clearly, very clearly evident to everyone. Mm. Now what is happening is, in any corporate, primarily in corporations, it's a top-driven approach. Mm. 
Mm. If the boss doesn't ask it, no one will do it. And even someone would do it, it's just a silo of excellence. Mm. It just falls down. So what is happening and what is very critical for India to succeed and the entire context of collaboration with Sweden, I think the leadership of the companies should empower their people. And that once you empower, I've been groomed in that country culture mm. for 15 years. You, em you be empowered and you be challenged. Mm. And then you deliver something which is beyond the normal. Um, Sanjay, would you comment that, please? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, what, what uh, Tito said is absolutely correct in terms of top-down approach. What we've done differently is we've said it's okay to fail, uh, which a lot of companies in India don't do. We've spent a lot of money on products that have failed, but they brought us to a certain point which allowed us to develop products that were extremely successful. And I think that learning curve comes with the mindset of an organization where you realize that the only way you can win is through innovation, through design, or through spending. It's private sector's role to put money in R&D. Mm. You know, uh, and we need to realize that and be responsible for that. Uh, so, so, and going over and above that, I think it's very important for companies to understand that collaborations and joint venture and technical agreements are there for you to learn technology and to absorb technology. What has happened in the automotive industry specifically, and I go back to the component industry, when we started off our journey in 1987, 1989, when Suzuki came to India, we all signed joint venture agreements. What we did differently was we bought our joint venture partners out because we learned the technology, because they restricted us geographically. So it's really our responsibility to learn technology, to learn from our partners, learn from the technology agreements, et cetera, and then build our own or invent our own products. I like that, invent in India. Mm. I think we need to first design in India mm. before we get to invent in India. And, and, and we need to position ourselves. We also have a very unique market which is very price sensitive. So we need to have frugal engineering, et cetera. So, so you know, we get sort of, um, sometimes that can become a challenge. However, what we need to look at is the world as a market mm. and not just India. Whilst our domestic market is huge, it's extremely large, extremely attractive for a lot of companies. Uh, you know, for us, the global market is also a huge uh, playground. How important is export from that point, point of view uh, in so terms of your own? Exports is, I mean, you know, in our business, we do about 80% export. And, and uh, today, uh, at, at the component level, at the component industry, we are, you know, very, very small in the grand scheme of things. We are doing a revenue of $70 billion and an export of $20 billion with with a mission to go to 100 billion in five years. So we've got a tall order. However, you know, uh, that's, that's our, our, our mission as a component industry. So mm. it's extremely, extremely important for us to be able to and export. Just briefly, we spoke about that before on uh, how important it is also for India to showcase the best companies and the best cases in India going abroad, and that, uh, going abroad as well. And that's where you see the exports because that's where we get exposed. Yeah, I think I think success stories, and, and I'm, I'm glad Manisha is here because the one question I get asked often is, will our IP be protected? Uh, you know, uh, I have a lot of uh, companies we work with in, in Israel, etc., that worry about IT, IP protection, and then it's there. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we need to look at it from that perspective. But yes, we have several success stories in India, in the manufacturing industry, in IT, in software, and these are things that we need to, you know, expose to, to the world to show them what you can build in India. And Manisha, um, is the IP that protective? It's on. Yeah. As far as the um, uh, IP ecosystem in the country is concerned, yes, uh, we were, I'm, I'm sorry I have to admit this, but we were not so great at one point of time. But today as we, we stand today in 2023, uh, we have uh, we have a very robust IP ecosystem of not only for protection, but even if somebody infringes and the enforcement, the with the IP division courts we have in Delhi, in Tamil and um, Madras high courts. So we can we have the best of the best standards litigation taken place in India, with the division bench of Delhi high court uh, saying that competition commission has no say in the SCP cases. Uh, because it's a proprietary of um, the patent holders. So many of the companies which could not enforce their standard essential patents in uh, 
China, where there was a huge amount of um, rights were being infringed, they managed to enforce it in India. Uh, we had um, Ericsson, we had Xiaomi, uh, we had uh, Interdigital, we had uh, um, Dolby, Nokia, all of them had successful cases of enforcement. So this establishes that, yes, we have a very strong and robust system of uh, protecting and enforcing. We had a lot of challenges in the patent system of long delays, uh, you know, inordinate delays, rather patents coming in the 18th year, but the term of the patent is 20 years, so coming in the 18th year, which was a very sad and disappointment. We, I, had was, I used to be very embarrassed to go internationally and say, oh yes. But now I can proudly say to the world and to myself also, that we have cases where we, the patents are being granted in the third year of the term which is a very unique thing. And the uh, biggest reason for that is digitization. It has made everything accessible uh, globally. And thanks to the European Patent Office, USPTO, and WIPO for training and contributing. Coming back to the innovation factor, mm. um, you know, the startup segment started innovating because of the investments they were calling for. The investors were not willing to invest if there was nothing unique in the business. Mm. And that's how innovation had started. So making in India can be co uh, collaborated and corroborated together and put bundled together and that's what's making it happen successfully. So investors were a big driver, a significant drivers to innovate. So that's how it started. So they said, okay, mm. we don't invest in you if you do not have a patent or a patent application. Mm. Because India historically doesn't have the culture of keeping all the knowledge to oneself. It's about spreading knowledge. Mm. Indian, Indian corporations were not very uh, agile or alert about, um, they were doing good business. So you don't need to innovate to do a successful business. But being in the global ecosystem, you cannot do business without, um, by stepping into somebody else's innovation. So if you have to buy 5G technology, or if you want to use 5G technology, you need to pay for the license fee. Right. So that's how, so now the awareness has come in. System is very good. Innovation is happening. Incrementally, it will gradually grow. Maybe we'll do wonders in the 6G. It's a, such a scale as well. Yes. So in the last two, two, uh, two three minutes, um, where do we all see, from your perspective, in your different industries, where do you see, from an innovative perspective, where India is um, uh, in, from the make in India, um, sustainability, innovation, where is India in five years? I'll start with you, Samir. Um, before I get to that, okay. one of the things we have left out, which we not, did not speak about, is mission life, which is something that Niti Aayog has, has taken on as a mission, mm. which is to nudge the citizens of India towards sustainable living. Yeah. And it's, that is what is taking India truly towards sustainability, because like we talked about throughout the day, what we do as manufacturers or industry also needs to be reciprocated by what the consumers do as, as responsible consumers. So that is one initiative which is, again, India it's has taken. It's one of the, the biggest during both G20 and B20. That's correct. Mm. So that is, again, and it is having a huge impact, and that is what truly will convert. Uh, coming to your question, I believe that the two challenges that we face as humanity today is AI and climate change. Um, and both we will only resolve and solve if we collaborate, and much to the entire debate on IP, we will need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And pandemic has taught us that, that the only reason we could overcome this was because we could invent a vaccine in a year which we had never done in history of humanity before, only because we could collaborate. Yeah. And so I think that is where we need to look at things differently. Um, AI is something which is a challenge, which is much bigger, I believe, because we still haven't started collaborating on that. Climate change is something that every government has a policy on. Mm. There are collaborations, there are events like this which are happening, which will lead us to a problem, to a solution to the problem. Yep. So I hope something like this is being done for okay. AI also. Rajinder. Um, <clears throat> in the last, I think, about seven years, we have moved from 87 to 40 on the innovation index. I presume there will be unshackling of innovation. There will be breaking down of barriers and we'll find India moving much further up in the next five years, maybe in the top 20 to say the least. But one small suggestion, and I wanted to give that, 
because you are part of that very important India-Sweden group. Uh, there should be some kind of a collaboration which should be on critical and emerging technologies between Indian industry and Swedish industry. There should be a formalized platform. We have recently signed a similar platform between Indian industry and US industry. Mm. UK is asking for a similar platform. France is asking for the same platform. I think something like that is strongly recommended to be taken up. I think that will help us move much faster into the Interesting. innovation index. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I think uh, the, the crux of all we are talking about comes to the point of capability of thinking. And if that thinking is different, then only someone can able to make it sustainable. Someone make it uh, AI because AI is you are talking about application, developing of next of AI. Mm. Or if you're talking about developing any new thing, it all comes to the fundamental fact that ability to think and invent. Mm. I think unless and until, if you don't nurture the capability of uh, inventing thinking, mm. um, as long as we start doing it, I think we will be just growing much bigger. Much bigger than. And uh, I would take uh, one step for forward for uh, what uh, Rajendra talked about. I think uh, India would be in top 10 on global innovation index. I think, uh, as we start building the capability in the country, uh, we can invent for everyone. Everywhere. Conquering the chaos, win in India, win everywhere. <laughs> like the book I mean, says. we collaborate. I think that the point is, <laughs> I'm just trying to bring the context of the capability of thinking. Yep. And anything in a global world and environment, there's no substitute for collaboration. Nope. So collaboration is given. But collaboration happens when there are partners. The fact that how, you, how India can build partners is the capability in the thinking. Mm. And if the thinking can be brought in with inventions, we can bring anyone on the table mm. with the capability as a partner to mm. that. I think in the game in that sense also, yeah. Absolutely. That's how you are part of a game. Yeah. And you can play that. Thank you very much. Uh, Manisha and Sanjay, very briefly. Yeah. Um, taking forward from Tito, collaboration is very important. Um, I have one uh, latest update from India is that uh, uh, a very US, uh, a US corporation, Interdigital, which ac uh, acquired Thompson also, has signed up with IIT Kanpur mm. for f more techno technology development, in particularly 5G, 6G, those type of areas. And personally, I'll be uh, seeing what from 97 till today, whatever has happened in intellectual property, innovation, patents, enforcement, I'm very confident that it's going to move further ahead. Uh, not having a single Indian patent application to manage, today we work for many of the R&D centers, including the DRDOs and all. So we know it's happening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. I think from my perspective, um, you know, in the next five years, we're at the fifth largest economy. We should be third or fourth largest economy. Uh, we should, from four trillion, we should be about six or seven trillion. Uh, we're gonna grow no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would just say, you know, jump on the bandwagon because, uh, you know, we're here, it's India's time and, and, uh, and we've seen some great success and, and the economy is just gonna grow uh, leaps and bounds. Jump on the bandwagon. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's give him all a warm applause. <laughs>